any time that um, one is invited uh, to a conference, you know, it puts a different kind of stress level um, on what you would typically do to show what you're doing. Um, and to somehow classify or sort your work or thinking about, about how your work applies to uh, the theme. And, and certainly conference uh, on ambiance um, really you know, made me really think about, well, what is it that we do and is that, it's, is that everything we do actually? Uh, what would be the most pertinent to, to uh, in a kind of moment of self-reflection uh, to put together um, and, and share in some form. So um, I, I'm not sure that this is very cogent, but what I tried to do was, um, was just um, uh, think about how our work that really is um, uh, conceived these days, very often in public spaces, very often in different scales, as Marco was saying, um, um, how it applies to beyond bricks and mortar stuff and how um, we've been using information technologies and uh, strategies of disturbances and ephemera and framing devices and uh, working with soft media like, so, like, like water and air and mist and so forth, um, how all of this kind of um, compiles into a, a body of work. Um, the work, you know, as I, as I think about it, um, is more and more about nothing. Um, it's about or almost nothing. And this is um, somehow um, very characteristic of, of the first um, work that I, I wanted to just put up, which is uh, this piece that we did uh, just after 9-11 uh, in New York. Um, the, the, the general public had a huge compulsion to bear witness um, at, the w, uh, at the World Trade uh, Center site. And, um, and no one was really allowed past the barricades. This is a couple of weeks after, after the, the, the buildings came down. Um, and uh, the reason was that there were still many uh, vehicles uh, that were there in the kind of just post-recovery effort and cleanup effort, and they didn't want to obstruct access. Um, and so because there was this, this uh, uh, difficulty, um, we took it upon ourselves, kind of out of civic responsibility, um, and particularly as the city was so disorganized and there was no bureaucracy to stop us, uh, we built this, this ramp, it's a 300 foot long ramp uh, at Fulton Street. Um, and it's, it, it connects an area that was accessible to the public at that time, and the, the ramp rose up to 13 feet uh, in the air, just in front of uh, the site. And there it is. Um, we did this with, uh, we just made a, a foundation uh, and with our colleagues at, at Rockwell Group. And, um, and we got money together and then we got a contractor and we just, we just built it out of um, very cheap materials. And the platform ascended to this viewing platform um, that looked out um, over basically emptiness. And, um, and we, we really started to, you know, we, we understood how incredibly charged, we were also obsessed with tourism and uh, uh, culture visuality in general and, uh, and just the, the, the notion of, of, um, of, of how potent invisibility can be and emptiness and nothing can be. Um, switching stations entirely Sometimes the strongest effects are ones that are barely evident. Um, like, there's something wrong with this picture. What is it? Um, something maybe a bit destabilizing. Um, this is a grove of hornbeam trees. Um, it's planted in a, a brownfield uh, site. It's an Aki uh, route on the way to Liverpool. And um, some of these trees have these kind of strange behaviors. Anyway, when you pass by the site, you, you notice that something isn't quite right. And uh, and this is, I think, very characteristic um, of, of our work, that um, you know, sometimes it's just uh, simply um, making something, just disturbing uh, the context is enough. I, I, I want to wait till there's a point in this um, 
video that's really spooky. You know, this one. This is this is sped up a little bit. Well, anyway, it was uh, th this was meant to be a temporary installation, and somehow they they now they want to keep it for, uh, forever. And the trees really love it because they <laughs> they get they get sun all the way around. <laughs> Anyway, uh, just moving on, um, many of our projects are somehow, I don't know why, but they're made of vapor and smoke and scent and um, the Vice Virtue uh, uh, series of, of glasses um, are also about that. Uh, so this, this is uh, something about um, uh, this kind of latent relationship to cigarettes, which is carried on into, um, into this other project. And uh, I've never shown this. It's called No No Smoking. And um, it's a decentralized installation in, um, planned for Amsterdam. It, it was not executed, unfortunately. Um, but um, it, so it was, the intention was to have these sites uh, all throughout um, Amsterdam. And um, smoking has, has become a symbol of the conflict between individual freedom and collective responsibility. The cigarette is a reminder that one may not necessarily have the right to be self-destructive in a culture that aspires to share the cost of health insurance. Um, increasing efforts uh, to reduce smoking and, and secondhand smoke in public spaces have created a new urban outlaw, the smoker. Um, and the last refuge for the lone smoker is outside, in, outside of these new no smoking establishments um, and now even those spaces are threatened. So the idea was um, the installation um, uh, that would actually cast the smoker as both a villain and a victim um, in the system of, of private shafts of space attached to the exterior of, of buildings. Um, and they act as chimneys basically that lift secondhand smoke above the streets. Uh, and this is uh, a detail. And. Um, uh, in, the sh in the shaft, there is a digital display um, for which we devised a, um, a smoke-activated interface. So, <laughs> um, so basically, this, um, this interface, uh, so when you puff, um, it, it activates the, the sensor which um, uh, uh, connects you to a network of smokers all around the city. <laughs> that are all estranged at this point. Um, but this kind of obsession with this immaterial stuff, the, the, the ephemera, um, was really, I think, um, most strongly in our work um, at, at the Blur Building. And I still look back on it and think, my god, you know, how, did, how is it possible for Switzerland, of all places on Earth, to allow us to do this? Um, it's sited on um, Lake Neuchâtel, which, um, and this is a temporary structure for Swiss Expo 2002. Um, and this architectural icon was made of nothing but droplets of atomized water. Um, and also two fairly conventional architectural systems, that of structure and plumbing. Um, but it aspired to produce a pure atmosphere. Um, the structure is a, t a tensegrity structure and um, the idea is that the, the lake water is pumped through this uh, uh, filtration system, and then it's shot through 35,000 fog nozzles uh, into this dynamic fog mass, which um, changes moment to moment. And these are uh, these, these uh, very small fog misters that are use, used in agriculture most of the time. Um, so the structure has a smart weather system, and um, it reads the shifting climatic conditions of temperature, humidity, wind speed, wind direction, dew point, and it processes the data in a central computer and calibrates the degree of water pressure. Water pressure. Um, and so this was a, a smart system. It had to really learn um, uh, how to behave um, in real time, and then it started to... Uh, uh, to act on its own once it, it, it understood the parameters. Um, 
So entering Blur was like stepping into a medium. Oh, on the right is the, is the space inside. Um, and this, this space is, um, is or, or this medium, is, is formless, it's featureless, it's depthless, scaleless, massless, surfaceless, and dimensionless. And visual and acoustic references are erased, leaving only an optical whiteout and white noise of uh, pulsing fog nozzles. Um, so Blur is an exhibition pavilion. It's an exposition pavilion where there's nothing to see and there's nothing to do. And it was um, our interest in a kind of ocular-centric culture where uh, satisfaction is, is expressed in pixels per inch um, to do something that's decidedly low def. Um, and, and in this, we really worked with a kind of um, uh, de-emphasis on an environmental scale, scale. And so while the world is put out of focus, our visual dependence is put into focus. And um, emerging out of blur was like coming out of a cloud when you're in an airplane. So the stair took you straight up um, and um, let's see what I have here. Um, underneath the angel bar, which is at the very top, there is this, this water bar, and this serves all the waters of the world. So you've breathed the architecture, now you can drink it, and it's the site as well. So architecture and site, atmosphere, um, and, um, and pleasure are, are all one and the same. Um, so waters from all over the world were collected uh, specifically for culinary uh, pleasure. And, and this was like the beginning of a, an interest in water co connoisseurship, connoisseurship that, that, um, that, that kind of evolved into some further projects. Connoisseurship? Connoisseurship, sorry. Um, so this is, this is uh, just, you know, I found this on the internet. I find the best images of our work on the internet um, screw photographers. Um, this, this is uh, this, but this is an example of really how it went. That the the context and the weather and the climate and the architecture all uh, were somehow um, s synthetic here. And the nighttime. So then, um, this was meant to be a temporary structure, and at one point um, after the expo closed, it was dynamited. Um, and it just kind of went up into a black cloud, and, um, and that was it. And then uh, the divers went in, collected all the steel, and sold it to China for uh, tall buildings. Um, but while um, blur evaporated, um, it was immortalized in chocolate. And I have to say, this is the highest honor to be bestowed upon an architect in Switzerland. We still have these in our refrigerator, uh, turning white. So. Um, but initially, when this, when this building and this project was unwelcomed by the Swiss press because it cost 10 million uh, francs and, and, um, and fog was already there in abundance, why would they want more? Uh, Blur became an icon um, for Switzerland, and it, it was on everything. It was on every piece of literature, um, on every product. And it came to represent the Swiss doubt, which is really interesting, because you make something that is, um, that's very abstract, that is really made of the material that's there, and it's read in so many different ways. It was read religiously, it was read in a surreal way, and it was read somehow to, to um, express the politics of the time, of Switzerland being in the middle. Um, anyway, this kind of interest in... Um, this kind of soft media of water and mist and so forth, um, was extended to this project in uh, Kemi in Finland. And uh, this was just after um, the Swiss Expo. And um, uh, again, the, the water con connoisseurship, connoisseurship, why can't I present into a French audience also? Oh my God. Um, <laughs> I already apologize that I haven't slept, so that's, that's part of it. Anyway, this, we were invited to Kemi uh, for something called the Snow, sh snow Show. And, um, and we were very interested in this harbor site, um, which um, is very beautiful, but also belies 
the growing specter of pollution at its, at its shores, and the advancing consequences of climate change. Um, the show was, was um, uh, sighted across from an active paper mill um, and in the dead of winter. And so we took the frozen harbor and we basically um, cut away these cubic spaces um, and we made implants of designer water in, uh, in, those, uh, in those cubes. And so these guys are standing actually on the harbor right now. And so we collected waters, again, from all over the world, you know, from Perrier, the obvious, to church water, I mean, to, but all sorts of waters, um, 881 international waters, and they're entombed basically in the sea. Um, the logos are, um, are also, so you could see there, that's the, that's the, the plant, uh, the paper plant. And, um, and um, the technique here that we used, I, yes, here, we etched the logo uh, right into the surface of the ice. Um, and so these are all like specimen of, of designer waters. And all of this is internally illuminated also. So here it is. And at night, yeah, internally illuminated. You could walk across it. Um, um, and in the spring, the idea is that, um, uh, that when the water thaws, um, all these waters just naturally return um, to, their, to their habitat, uh, taken out of their fake habitat. Um, and Anyway, so water continues to be um, kind of a point of obsession. In, um, for the 2008 Ve Venice Biennale, we set out to convert Venice's um, often photogenic, not very he uh, much here, but photogenic, uh, but notoriously filthy canal water um, into the best espresso in, in Italy. Um, that was the strategy and um, <laughs> So the, the installation um, uh, entails a water purification, a purification system uh, that basically speeds up the cleansing effects of tidal wetlands. And um, so here is the, um, the uh, image. Uh, and here we see the, the cordieri. Um, and a, a transparent pipe basically is um, just, just feeds out of the canal and basically pumps water in um, and propels it through a state-of-the-art purification system that first filters the water and distills it out of the sludge uh, and the sewage and the toxins. And when the water is clean enough to drink, it slows, slowly falls um, like an IV drip where it's boiled into steam and forced through coffee grounds to become the quintessential Italian pick-me-up um, uh, and, and served in a kind of improvised espresso bar at the center of the exhibition. Um, so beyond normal touristic consumption, uh, visitors can also drink uh, the, the site again. So we're very much interested in drinking um, sites and architectures. Um, anyway, the project reveals the tremendous resources required to sustain even our most quotidian comforts and calls into question an implicit social contract. When turning on the faucet, um, water, uh, that, that water will always somehow be safe and clean and drinkable. Um, why do we believe that? Um, anyway, after this project was fully engineered and passed through all the health uh, regulations, um, appro the, um, and we got all the approvals right from the top, uh, it was stopped at kind of a lower uh, uh, pass through the administration um, due to political fallout uh, caused by the premature letting of a water purification contract. So there are many um, uh, companies that were competing for the, for the water, water purification in Venice, and, uh, and this was a conflict anyway. It was heartbreaking because we almost pulled it off. Um, but moving on to um, exhibitions, and you know, we have always in our work been somewhat resistant um, to museums, and I, I remember very well when we occupied this one, um, and, uh, and we worked uh, with the uh, CCA on this uh, great show uh, called The American Lawn, uh, The Surface of Everyday Life, and, uh, and I remember counting all the blades of grass 
outside, and we, uh, we actually mowed it and, and so forth with some collaborators and, um, and installed a show that was, uh, and Alessandra Ponte is here, and she, she was a collaborator on that, on that project, on a curatorial project. Um, anyway, uh, the, the um, occupation of museums has always been a kind of question, though. Um, how do we take our work out of uh, public space and, and um, kind of public sites? and into a museum and, and really understand the museum as, um, as another site, not just a repository for um, authenticated stuff. Uh, uh, you know, that's, that's already important, but, but how do we, how do we crit critically look at the museum? And we're, I guess, still part of, um, of that, that culture of, um, of cultural, uh, or the cultural critique culture that, that um, that still has a kind of um, uh, an eye um, to well, what, what does the museum mean anyway? What does the white wall mean? And we're constantly thinking about it. And, um, and this, when we were asked to do a, um, a mid-career retrospective at the Whitney Museum, this is just a, another event happening at the Whitney, but just to situate it. Um, we, we were very concerned mid-career retrospective. That means we're almost like, are we really in the middle of our lives? Um, it was very scary. We went into a crisis. Um, but nevertheless, we were asked to bring in our installations into the museum. And there were, most of our installations are site specific. So it was very difficult to imagine how to bring in um, uh, uh, these a whole myriad of, 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 of installations into the fourth floor of the Whitney. Um, this is the floor plan uh, that, uh, uh, that shows how we divided the space. And basically, we made um, galleries, and we used white walls to make galleries. But we also um, couldn't do this with a straight face um, without making a kind of Uber installation, um, which made all the other installations kind of like there um, as almost decoys for the other one, which had to do with, um, uh, with this robot, this robotic drill that basically, I just go back, this red dotted line is the track that this robot took in and out of every gallery um, while it performed its acts. Uh, so we worked with Honeybee Robotics, which is uh, 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 kind of a robotics uh, science group, which made the Mars driller, and we were, um, why not? Um, this, uh, device was meant to drill holes. And it's, um, so it's mounted on this track that goes in and out of every uh, gallery and basically unfolded um, the system of walls into a kind of big map. And there is a, an intelligent navigator, okay, so that directs um, the, uh, the drill to some part of the wall that it hasn't already touched. And then, um, okay, so this is, just the drill. These are, these are its brains, kind of messy. Um, and here it goes. So the intelligent na navigator selects a point along the wall. It navigates the drill to that place. And then it pierces the wall with this half inch hole. This is the sound it makes, just in case there are some people in the way. The museum actually went crazy because we made dust, and so they made us actually collect the dust into, uh, ultimately, into a, a box. But anyway, and now it's just going off into another spot. So the holes initially begin as lone and random blemishes on the pristine white wall, but the, as the exhibition continues, the wall becomes increasingly perforated, Sometimes holes on both sides of the wall uh, align, and they open up views from gallery to gallery. And um, so here is a, 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 a gallery where we're showing some media. It was painted black, so all of a sudden light comes through. Um, and, and then it eventually eradicated um, this the curatorial text, uh, which was very great. Um, but, um, but anyway, you know, eventually the, these clusters of holes uh, weakened the wall and started to break down the wall. And the constant drone of the, uh, of the drill 
um, also uh, disturbed the, the acoustic isolation of the gallery. So the drill, in effect, was a kind of saboteur um, and uh, of kind of visual and, and sound isolation that is meant for the, for the wall. And, um, and it produced a kind of problem between the installations that we had, which didn't char characterize them very well. Um, but uh, the walls ultimately um, started to compete for, uh, started to, to uh, compete uh, for our attention or the attention of the audience rather than produce a, a neutral backdrop, which was the point. Um, at a certain uh, a moment in one of the galleries, the drill no longer behaved randomly. It, be, it started to behave um, in a kind of very interesting order. And this was also programmed into, um, into the, the performance of the drill. And this sort of, some, sometime midway through, it looked a little bit like this. We kept coming back and discovering um, how this was doing. And um, this was part, this piece of wall um, uh, that, that you see is, um, is actually extracted from MoMA. And so we had this obsession about the white wall and we thought, well, wouldn't it be great to graft a piece of a MoMA wall into a Whitney wall. And, um, and, and you could see that, and this MoMA wall is a very special MoMA wall, which I'll explain in a second, but um, it, it's a historic piece of, MoMA, uh, of MoMA's walls. And it has lots of layers of thick paint on it. So you can see that it, it, it kind of proceeds off the wall. And it also changes the behavior. So this is the location of uh, that, that piece of wall is directly behind Duchamp's standard stops. Okay, and this was, this, this gallery was taken over um, in the um, Taniguchi renovation um, by the, the contractor. And so we were able to talk them into um, surveying the wall and, uh, and being able to, uh, to take it apart. So this, this video may go on a little bit too long, but anyway, we um, got all of our smart people there, and then we start to plot the location. And it was, for, for somehow, that this piece, the standard stops, was very dear to me, and Duchamp was very much an influence on, on, on the studio's work. Um, so here we are, after having cut it open, we put it on a pallet, um, and then, long story, but anyway, we brought it to the Whitney, and they didn't know what to do with it. Is it a building material? Is it a piece of art? Does it go through, um, you know, and which department does it go through? Does it go through conservation and so forth? And so they were very, very confused about this thing. But um, anyway, it left a kind of big, ugly, nasty space, which we covered up with another um, sheetrock wall. Anyway, so we brought this... Um, Okay, so here it is, now transplanted, and, um, and here, here it is on the wall. And you could see that though even the white is not the white of the Whitney. The, all the museums have different whites, so there are hundreds of different whites. And this white was, the Museum uh, of Modern Art white was brighter than the Whitney white. Um, anyway, um, so I, I just wanna uh, go back to this, sorry, to this image. Um, after the retrospective was taken down, um, we saved this fragment um, for you know, just uh, sentimental reasons. And we cut it into pieces, like two-foot pieces that we gave away to some of our friends and colleagues kind of as souvenirs. Um, and it was very strange when MoMA asked to acquire uh, a piece of this wall into their collection. Um, and so here it is, you know, they, this is, uh, they're mounting a show and they just made a hole in another wall of theirs with this small <laughs> fragment of their original wall back on MoMA premises. Anyway, very strange. Um, so uh, the, the drill was also salvaged. So um, it was decommissioned after the retrospective and um, we were invited to bring it to Maxi in Rome uh, for the opening show there. And so we recast this drill with a different kind of performance in a different kind of white wall situation. 
Um, and uh, we turned it into a, a photo engraving device. So rather than drilling holes through a wall, um, it drilled holes of various depths and sizes into this very long wall uh, to produce the equivalent of a dot screen. Um, and so the piece, um, whoops, the piece was renamed, I'll just go back, the piece was renamed Drill Baby Drill. And um, um, for three months, it worked on making this mural. Um, and um, uh, it's, it's of one of the um, greatest man-made environmental disasters. Uh, There's the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And um, this is it uh, you know, partially uh, and this is the actual, the, actually the, the mural image, the photographic image. Um, this is the kind of intended dot screen effect. And, um, and here it is in uh, midstream doing this. It didn't, it, I don't have final photographs of this because it didn't turn out so well. Uh, um, but but it, the drill continues to be somehow like on our minds um, as a kind of active element that can just be reprogrammed uh, to rethink its, its purpose. Um, coming uh, back to the Whitney show, those holes, uh, we found things in those holes. And one of the things that we found was this note. Um, Please make the ICA turn out good. Um, this was when we were in the middle of, of working on, on the ICA uh, in Boston. And it's, it's a little bit like the, the Wailing Wall. You know, there were like these little messages that were caught there that people left. Um, I, 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 I kind of brought this into the, sh into the uh, talk just to um, say that, you know, at a certain point, one has to not resist the museum, but like sometimes even speak in the museum's voice. And here, um, as artists um, citing ourselves in the museum very often in a contrary way, um, we accepted the commission to do our first museum building, and now we're doing like five of them. Um, there, the, 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 the building is on the harbor in, um, in, in Boston, and um, I won't present the building has been widely published, um, but one of the most important things that the building does is it, um, it, it um, uses the site also as, a, it, it kind of curates the site. Um, uh, among its other purposes. And, um, and so here in the grandstand, it actually kind of clears space for the public to gather and just look at the view of the harbor uh, when they're not in the museum. And then there are different effects along the way inside of the building. And at the very top, and this is very green, all of the, everything's very green here, so you have to like recalibrate. Everything's pinker. Um, in, in my world here. Um, but the, the, the space that is suspended from this very long 80-foot cantilever is the Mediatek, and it's, I think, the most important space in the entire building. And um, I'll show it in a second. On the way up the building, you go past the uh, theater, which also has the view as a, as a kind of scenographic backdrop that could be turned on and off. Um, the glass elevator scans the view vertically. Um, the gallery on top turns it off entirely. Um, so all the focus is um, on the art. And here's the media tech. And it isolates a piece of the view um, and, um, and just simply creates a, 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 an environment where time just goes by and one is able to appreciate the time of day and the weather uh, just through the process of editing. And this has been a really, um, you know, kind of an interest of ours. It seems to recur in our work, and I'm going to show you kind of a similar thing that we've done in, another, uh, in a more recent project. Um, so the High Line. Um, in, in 2002, we became um, uh, part of one of the most unusual urban planning initiatives in New York transforming the High Line into a public park. And we did this in collaboration with uh, Pete Udolf and Field Operations. And for those of you who uh, don't know the High Line, it's a mi mile and a half long uh, uh, stretch of industrial uh, railway that's elevated. Um, and it goes from the Meatpacking District, um, southern end, uh, 
to the Hudson Yards and 34th Street at its northern end. And, um, and it's right off of the Hudson River. Um, it slices through uh, the urban landscape totally indiscriminately. And uh, this, was, this was taken uh, before and your work happened on the High Line. A uh, member of our staff got arrested when he was taken. You were not allowed up. Um, and so everything was really illicit about this space. But anyway, it carves through uh, buildings and uh, beside buildings and, uh, and a little bit of its history. Um, so it was built uh, in 29 to replace a surface train um, that went on the west side of Manhattan. And uh, pretty soon, as the population of Manhattan grew, so did the pedestrian conflicts. Um, so trains often uh, ran over, ran over uh, pedestrians. And then um, uh, this, this uh, cowboy uh, then led trains through and cleared um, people away so that, uh, that accidents would be avoided. Um, so anyway, the, the High Line then um, uh, grew and um, uh, was, was, um, was, uh, was built uh, 30 feet up in the air. And it was, um, it was active for about 50 years. Um, and then the um, highway system and trucking and so forth uh, basically devalued the, the necessity for, to have this elevated train track. Um, and it just stopped uh, being useful. So in 1980, it uh, delivered its last truckload of, of uh, frozen turkeys. Um, and this is in uh, Chelsea, where there's already starting to be change. Um, and the Dia Foundation moves there, and all of a sudden, uh, more, there's more and more attention in, into this site. Um, so by the uh, 80s, late 80s and early 90s, um, there um, is a lot of pressure on city government to demolish the High Line, because the property owners felt that it devalued uh, the, the, uh, their property. Um, and at that point, toward the late 90s, um, the Friends of the High Line, a grassroots effort, very young guys got together. Um, the, um, Joel Sternfeld was, was hired um, to, um, to photograph the High Line, and, uh, and he did so. So it was, it was a very difficult sell to actually sell the idea of retaining uh, and protecting the High Line. Uh, because this is really what it looked like, um, you know, just this kind of black, uh, uh, rusted uh, piece of infrastructure that went over streets and in and out of buildings, and it was all inaccessible. So um, Joel's photographs um, really made a huge difference, and um, you know, this is the kind of evidence of the political power of photography. These photographs were published in the New Yorker. And, um, and they ignited a kind of uh, the, the imagination of, of the general public and the politicians to understand that this place was really magical. And you could see the different kinds of um, what, you know, I think New Yorkers would think of as horticulture, but suburbanites would think of as weeds, um, but that grew just all, all over the place. And, and, and basically, you know, there were, it was self-seeded um, by seeds just coming off of uh, these, these freight trains. Um, anyway, as the last act uh, of, mayor, uh, of, 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 of Mayor Giuliani signed a court order to demolish the, the High Line, and uh, the new administration, the Bloomberg administration, came in. There was a, an ideas competition. We, we won with James Corner. And... Um, and we proceeded to, um, to, you know, to think about what's really right for the site. Um, there's something about the melancholia of that place that we wanted to preserve. But what was really interesting were all these species that grew there. And this is, again, self-seeded. But because there were so many micro-sites uh, along the High Line, because of the building conditions, sometimes tall buildings made a lot of shade, sometimes open areas were windswept and sun-drenched, and different kinds of seeds just kind of took root there and grew. Um, and so this was, there was this kind of natural microecology that was there that we were very much inspired by. All these different types of grasses. 
Anyway, the big question was, how do you bring the public up there without destroying the fragility of, of what's there and what uh, was there in a kind of wild expression of the post-industrial? And um, uh, so this is the wrong way to do it. You make a, a paved area and you let the, uh, the, the, uh, the organic stuff grow on one side. It's very narrow. Um, so we thought of another strategy, and it was very much inspired by the way that this kind of natural evolution of nature over culture over nature over culture keeps happening. Um, and the way these grasses grow through the cracks of sidewalks and destroy them. Um, so we uh, devised a paving system that basically digitized the whole surface of the High Line into areas of uh, hardscape or greenscape. And um, they could, these, these pavings, uh, paving uh, pieces could be organized in any uh, concentration. So you can get 100% uh, green area, or you can get a 100% uh, softscape, uh, hardscape, or anything in between, any gradient in between. And it's very important that these pavers also taper um, to allow the, um, the plants to grow in between. Um, and so this is uh, a view of, of the High Line from uh, Standard Hotel. So this, this original flora, actually, and fauna, starting to come back, and a lot of the original flora was, uh, was really brought back. Uh, the seeds were saved. And so um, this is two, uh, now, now f f uh, the two phases of the High Line. As I said today, um, it, we broke ground on section three, which is um, still actually on the drawing boards, but they're starting to remediate the site. Um, so, so this question of the ecological balance, um, which has kind of tipped in another direction, I just want to show you some, some images that were taken over the last couple of years. This was uh, one of the ideas is to, to uh, repurpose industrial uh, uh, remnants to post-industrial uses. Um, everything is made of the language of the planks, um, and just with li ambient lighting, uh, we're able to really produce different kinds of spaces. And uh, still parking lots, thank God, around. Um, this is some of the kind of great photos that I found on the internet. Um, this is commissioned. Anyway, so this is part of section two, which is very narrow and uh, in between um, blank walls. Very, very different from section one, if some of you have, have been there. Um, also overlooks and, um, and an opportunity to see the very last remnants of industrial New York and uh, the kind of grittier side of New York. So a lot of spaces where people can look at virtually nothing but blank walls. Um, so something happened um, at the High Line, which we um, really didn't, we couldn't have predicted. Um, these new behaviors start to happen. So this, is, this was built uh, by Polshek. It's the standard hotel. And it was the only uh, part of the High Line where there was zoning that permitted building over it. Um, and so they took advantage of it right away. So this building was made. Um, but. Um, Occupants of the hotel decided that, that this was like a perfect uh, captured audience uh, that was on the High Line and um, that all sorts of great performances could happen there. And so <laughs> we also started to collect um, stuff from the internet. Um, and <laughs> what was kind of fabulous was that it was a kind of, you know, it was a mutual understanding that people watched, people performed. Uh, but it was totally uh, uh, unpredictable. And, um, and so this is like, a, you know, we would think of this as, as there's something, you know, weird about the, what happened on the High Line with this natural medium, um, post-industrial, and then it sprung up again, and then there are these natural new urban behaviors. So what's, what's natural and what's not 
um, is, is really a question. This is a really interesting phenomenon. There was a, a tenement building. Um, it was at the end of the first phase of construction. And there was a construction light that was accidentally aimed on the window just right next to the, uh, uh, next to the fire escape. And it turned out that the person that lived there um, is, was a cabaret singer. And so she would come out every night <laughs> onto her fire escape. And, and that, that light was just there by accident. And, um, and so she performed, and she just mic'd the space, and, and a whole crowd gathered around um, the renegade cabaret singer. But anyway, there's a ton of things like this that, that, have hap that, that has happened um, on the High Line. And, um, um, and we're just, you know, it, it, it continues to surprise us what goes on. Um, one of the features that we made here was, um, this is just, this is the way it looked before. Um, and this is a spur um, that's just on 10th Avenue, over 10th Avenue. And we simply um, took away the steel structure below and the available space, and we just put some glazing there and, and made a kind of amphitheater. Um, and the amphitheater was um, just simply uh, overlooking 10th Avenue. Um, and, and the cars there. And um, people gather there to watch. And um, we're, we're absolutely convinced that the success of the High Line has to do with introducing New Yorkers to the concept of doing nothing. You know, I mean, you can't do anything there. You can't rollerblade, you can't ride your bike, you can't, you know, you can't bring up any wheels. You, you, there's very little you can do. You can sit and you can walk, and that's about it. But, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the notion of looking out at car, uh, just the rear lights of cars is very much like, um, it's a very uh, kind of uh, Jerry Seinfeld idea, you know, this kind of, of uh, desire, this beauty of the nothingness of, of just watching things that are very slow for a moment and being excused from doing anything productive. Anyway, um, this, uh, uh, the High Line effect, um, so what was once considered an eyesore uh, was then, uh, uh, became a kind of great uh, gentrifier in that, in that area, and beyond all wildest dreams. It was argued first uh, as a catalyst for development, but no one knew uh, just how fast it would go and all the new buildings that are being built around it. Um, the High Line's cost to date has been $153 million, but it's generated an estimated $2 billion in new developments in New York. And so our mission first started as architects of the High Line, um, and then it turned into protecting the High Line from architecture. <laughs> so I, you know, there are just um, so many um, uh, things that are going on there. It's, it's been branded by, by everyone and everything. There are always these activities that use the name of the High Line. This was, I found this someplace. Everything is called the High Line. The name is not, we, we can't preserve the name, right? So it's not uh, copyrightable. But it is a place where um, uh, you know, Sex in the City was shot. All these fashion elements, the High Line bag and the dress, these are all High Line things. Um, we, we were not immune to it. We designed this dress out of um, uh, bacon and salami. Uh, this was a uh, competition for this Miss Meatpacking District. Um, <laughs> anyway, we just kind of got into the role of all the stuff that was happening there. And you know you've really succeeded when your um, stuff, your park, is a part of an establishing shot for the family guy. Um, and then it's, you know, it's, it's everywhere, uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, in, in uh, Daredevil Comics, um, just kind of everywhere we turn, it's really kind of part of the world. Um, there was a, there's a new scent now out called Highline Bond Number no. 9. It's the first world, uh, it's the world's first railroad fragrance. And... <laughs> It advertises itself as the scent of wildflowers, green grasses, and urban renewal. <laughs> I, could, I couldn't make this up. Uh, 
Anyway, um, there are high lines uh, springing up. It's gone viral. It's, uh, they're proliferating all over the world. And um, here are some examples uh, in the States. This one is particularly sad, but uh, and some of these are are. Um, this one is just about to open in Mexico City and Lima, Calabria, Jer Jerusalem, <coughs> Shenzhen, and uh, they they continue to um, to come up. <laughs> um, it's it's impossible to replicate the High Line, though. Um, the magic is a product of density and the collision of the unintended. It's kind of, you know, uh, we, we pride ourselves uh, in not having screwed up what was already beautiful. I mean, that's the thing about doing nothing. It's like knowing how much of a voice to have and when to, to peel back. Um, the accidental ecosystem we found at the beginning of the project, um, that is all these seeds that were just airborne and, and uh, the self-seated nature of it. So this, this ecosystem um, has changed into uh, one in which um, natives and tourists and artists, executives, socialized club kids, cruisers, retirees, sunbathers, fitness buffs, fashionistas, and even flashers uh, produce a kind of new biodiversity, which is um, essentially and purely New York. Uh, urban parks are typically an escape from the city. You go to the High Line to re-enter the city, but this time it's unconscious. The imperfect, the overlooked, the blank party walls and innards of buildings, the loading docks and chop shops at arm's distance from cars parked up in the air in mechanical lifts next to fire escapes and smokestacks, floating at the height of giant underwear ads. Um, and even as the, uh, as the condos go up, the High Line will always refuse to fit neatly into the logics of the city. So it's a kind of friction to the city. Um, you know, there's a kind of, um, uh, we had a kind of nostalgia initially um, for the site and this, uh, you know, this post-industrial uh, atmosphere of it. And, um, I think that right now we're in this kind of really interesting moment because all of these buildings are, because of the development that has spawned, are coming up all over the place. And there's this moment that is somewhere between nostalgia uh, for the past and a loss of the past and a kind of skepticism and fear about a homogenized monocultural future. And there is a fear that, uh, and a suspicion that the High Line will consume itself and fall victim to its own success. But right now, still, there's a kind of vac vacancy, that there's, a, there's a balance between vacancy and gentrification. Um, and it's a, it's a place that's unaccountable to time and, and productivity, as I mentioned. Anyway, this goes on to, uh, to the beginning of section three. I wanted to show um, uh, another project that is very much on theme, and that is um, uh, the Hirschhorn Museum. So the, the Hirschhorn Museum is on the, on the right of the mall. It's the circular one in concrete. And the mall is one of the most revered public spaces in America. Um, it's a symbol of American democracy. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's not a thing, it's, not a, it's, not, it's a symbol, it's not a thing, it's a space. Uh, and it's the place where citizens can voice their disconsent, discontent and, uh, and show their power. It's a place where pivotal moments in uh, uh, US national history are forever marked. So um, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 63, uh, and Martin Luther King's uh, great speech, um, massive anti-Vietnam protests in the late 60s, um, and the commemoration of, uh, for those who died in the um, AIDS pandemic, um, the march for, uh, for women's reproductive rights, and, um, and many others, including this. Um, it, it, the mall is, is the, the greatest civic stage in the, in, in, in the US uh, for dissent, and it's synonymous with free speech, 
even if the only agenda may be civic commiseration. And that's what these guys did. Um, but there's a disconnect uh, between the communicative and discursive space of the mall and the mute museums that surround the mall. Um, the passive relation between the museums and, audi and the audience that goes to see them um, is repeated each time um, uh, on the mall. The museum presents and the audience receives. And this is, um, is really kind of strange um, because if you think about what's, uh, what's happening on the mall, it's this like really fantastic uh, uh, place that's surrounded by all these embassies and think tanks. Uh, when Richard Kashalik took over as director of the Hirshhorn, uh, he determined that he wanted to take advantage of the museum's unique location at the seat of power in the US. And um, while art and politics are implicitly connected, this particular site offered more potential uh, for more explicit political activities. Um, the question was, is it possible for art to insert itself into the dialogue of national and world affairs, and could the museum be an agent in cultural diplomacy? Um, so, you know, we think yes. Um, anyway, uh, so the Hirshhorn decided to expand its mission uh, beyond exhibiting modern and contemporary art in its galleries. It would become a public forum on relevant issues of arts, culture, politics, and policy. And it would have the reach of the World Economic Forum and interdisciplinarity of the TED Conference and kind of the informality of the, time square, uh, of the town square. And for this new initiative, um, there would have to be a temporary structure. So this was meant as a temporary uh, place that would go up, a space that would, that, would, that would appear twice a year for a month or two at a time. Uh, this is the Hirshhorn. Um, in, it was designed in uh, 74 by Garden Bunshaft, and it's a piece of architecture that architects love to hate. It's hulking and silent and cloistered and arrogant and all those great things, and it's an incredible design challenge. Um, one of the redeeming features about the Hirshhorn is that it's lifted off the ground, and, um, and there's a big hole in the middle. Um, so where is the site of expansion? I, there was no site outside. I mean, obviously, it would be the hall. Um, and uh, the museum uh, needed to expand its f footprint by 17,000 square feet. There was actually not enough in the hall. So we had to actually find more space. But um, what would the language of, of the architecture be? Um, so actually, this is the side with its limits as a whole. Um, the, the Hirshhorn sits among the mall's monumental institutions, and most of them are neoclassical. They're heavy, opaque, made of stone or concrete. Ada Louise Huxtable uh, called them the dinosaurs of American culture disposed to infinity. Um, anyway, um, what should the material of the new program be? Um, we decided it had to be air. Um, and it had to be light, it had to be ephemeral, formless, and it had to be free. And so this was um, basically our presentation to uh, the Hirshhorn. This is how you make space, basically a giant airbag. Um, and we explained this as effectively inhaling the democratic space of the mall, the democratic air of the mall, so as contiguous space. So this is the, uh, the Hirshhorn uh, kind of before, and this is with the Hirshhorn bubble. Um, so the, as you can see, the, there's a kind of oozing of the, of the air off to the side, and this is the, the lounge, so there wasn't quite enough space. Um, but what, that's you know, an incredible thing. It's a, got basically a low-pressure airbag um, that is uh, made of silicon-coated uh, glass fiber fabric, and, um, and, it's, and it's temporary. It's at, uh, twice a year, and so there are they're, they're, this is uh, considered a national monument, so touching it permanently was also forbidden. So it had to be really light to the, to the touch. Um, 
And it's, it's one contiguous volume of air that's kind of restrained, uh, so when the wind blows, it doesn't move around, it's constricted by cables uh, that, that allow it just to wiggle a little bit, but not to hit the walls. Uh, the design was subject to approvals by the National Capital Planning Commission, the NCPC, which is the federal government's planning agency, um, and also the, the Commission of Fine Arts that counsels the government on matters that affect the federal interest and preserve the dignity of the nation's capital. Um, so you might be wondering, how did we ever get approval? <laughs> um, so this is the view of it. Well, these are some of the activities that we imagine uh, take any kinds of uh, uh, installations or, or, or congregations of people for virtually every purpose. Um, but the reason we got it accepted, um, this in the section sometimes makes me blush, um, but um, we kept iconoclasm, iconoclasm and um, adoration in some kind of balance. Um, so we, we also interpreted the rules kind of uh, loosely. Um, anyway, we defined uh, the, the bubble as a, as a dome. <laughs> and, um, you know, they, 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 they bought it. Um, <laughs> so this is the, um, this is the sequence that, um, that basically this is, uh, the bubble is rolled up and it comes on a truck, and then um, it's hoisted on cables. Uh, there's, a, there's a permanent ring that's put at the very top, and it's hoisted up, and then the air is pumped into it, and then it allows it to uh, fully lift itself. And then at the very bottom, that red is actually water ballast. So um, anyway, we showed this, this uh, uh, sequence, and uh, in one of the approval hearings, uh, we were asked, but this was approval hearings with lots of gray-haired gentlemen, uh, we were asked, um, and looking at the complexity of all of this, what was the duration of the ins installation process, uh, we were asked. So, um, um, you know, so how long does it take to put up? And we responded, typically, um, uh, the, uh, it will go up very fast, but the first erection would take seven days. <laughs> and, like, at that point, like, it was, it was love at first sight. The notion of a seven-day erection, I think, with <laughs> the... <laughs> I mean, really, uh, it was with all these really like elderly gentlemen that they really connected to the idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and we were told, it was really beautiful, the very last words, we thought that we would be stopped in the process, but they said, go away, inflate. And, <laughs> and anyway, so we, we didn't really find that much problem with the federal bureaucracies, however, um, um, the hardest uh, problem actually is actually is executing it, and it's the engineering that goes into into this. It's one of the biggest challenges. So this is form finding um, software that allows us to look at the uh, the warp and weft of the bubble, um, and um, this sort of stress uh, stress analysis, um, and it does take wind load, um, and and this is all it's a point cloud with every spot on the surface identified in space. And we're uh, working with German engineers, um, Form TL, uh, to, uh, to, to complete the engineering on this. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's quite a complex thing to, to pull off. Um, but basically, this, uh, this space will be um, a very flexible interior that uh, is used for discussions, uh, primarily discussions in the round. And so it's a circular shape, is perfect uh, for a forum. And it's really about, um, uh, uh, you know, the uh, ability to bring in uh, the kind of natural populations that, that, that aggregate, that congregate uh, in, in uh, D.C. Um, and the first uh, program will be a cultural dialogue and diplomacy organized um, in partnership with the Council on Foreign Relations. So that's already in the works. Um, and uh, the view from above, so it's very, very tall. Um, the bubble is an anti-monument, basically. Uh, it's made out of air. The ideals of participatory 
participatory democracy are represented through suppleness rather than through rigidity. Art and politics occupy an ambiguous site, both inside and out, um, that is outside the museum walls, but within the museum's core. So um, a brand new ambiance uh, will be created uh, in which art and politics can naturally coexist. And the bubble will open in fall 2013. And that's it, thank you. Um, I was wondering if, uh, like the questions that we were, you were raising yourself, um, like the idea of iconizing and uh, homogenizing and everything, I was wondering if we are not falling in the iconization of the senses of the city. So everything that is not considered material, the air, the water, the smell, and everything else is being iconized. Uh, Atomized. Icon. Uh, icon. Iconized. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I was wondering what you think about that. <laughs> um, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm in the case of, of, of the High Line, um, I mean, I think that that is, uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's a case in point where uh, infrastructure and open air space, um, it, it, it inadvertently uh, became I iconized. Um, um, and I think that it was, it's, in a, you know, as I say, inadvertently, you know, the, 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 all the people around that project um, intended to simply make um, uh, a kind of open, uh, kind of free open space uh, around an existing infrastructure in another form. And, and you know, we typically go to parks that are focal and, uh, and, and sometimes large and small, but uh, to, to have a, a, a space that one could move in and wander and, and uh, um, maybe an old fashioned way promenade, you know, was something very, very foreign to a city like New York. So. Um, the moment that um, it, um, you know, it, it, it opened, um, I, it, something else happened, and I can't really um, explain the phenomenon. I often wonder myself how it's possible for, and so the kind of, the kind of theorizing that, that there is an attraction to nothingness, to, um, you know, in a, in a, in a city, where every piece of real estate is so important and so expensive, and it flips, you know, constantly and increases its value, um, that uh, uh, that that this moment, this this kind of very very precious um, uh, piece of space that uh, is intended really for no purpose at all but to, for promenading, just became a sensation. And I think that you know the the concern that I express myself is that. Uh, the possibility of, of uh, this very successful um, uh, uh, space really eating itself up uh, with too many tourists. And, and already, um, I think, a lot of native New Yorkers are, are only going to the Highlands certain times of day uh, to avoid uh, the, the, uh, the congestion. So I, I don't know. I don't know if, if, if everything could be bought and sold, I mean, air, is certainly bought and sold, uh, and uh, air rights, and um, and there's nothing that's not consumable. Um, but you know, this this the high line for us was a point of resistance to to consumption. But inevitably, it gets caught up in uh, in a system where, when you add value, you know, value then becomes duplicated and triplicated. So, so you can't win. Um, any other questions? Hello. I'm, I'm wondering, um, the architecture you do is, is very, very close to science, and uh, the, 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 the role that the science play in your architecture is extremely strong. And I'm wondering how you do this collaboration. If there's somebody in, in science in your office, <laughs> at what point these people get in the conversations and, and how you achieve to keep uh, ideas that are extremely clear at the beginning with the sketches you're showing, uh, very clear at the end, even when we don't understand anything, I would say. 
I mean, uh, you achieve a, a, a height level of, uh, of science that it's, it's out of our... Yeah. Um, interesting. I, we, we often um, jump out of airplanes without parachutes. Uh, and um, a lot of the, the kind of the desire to d often do something, we have an idea. We have no idea how to do it. And then we start, as a research studio, we, um, we kind of pride ourselves in learning about lots of things along the way. So, and we tend to not repeat anything that we already know. And, and so in the case of, uh, for example, um, bl a blur, it was, um, uh, we didn't know how to, we, did, we thought, well, we could just hire somebody that knows how to make a cloud. And, and you know, there are no consultants for that. And uh, Fujiko Nakaya was actually very, very helpful. You know, she did the first, um, the expo with the, the, the Pepsi uh, pavilion with, with, a, with, a, with the uh, fog. But, and she continues to do fog projects. But to do something at the scale that we were doing was ne had never been done. And it had never been done in open air. And, and she, in fact, said, you can't do it. It won't ever work. And so we uh, did a lot of research. And we were very, um, uh, you know, we, we dedicated ourselves to to, to figuring out how to make it work. And so between agriculture and between um, uh, climate scientists and water scientists and so forth, we figured out how to do it. But it was, it, that particular project was very, uh, uh, was a matter of concern because we learned later, once we figured out how to purify the water, um, we realized that if uh, any contaminants, if it wasn't absolutely pure, absolutely purer than drinking water, um, the lungs could not accept uh, any kind of, you know, any kind of bacteria in the air that you breathe. And that's what, what Legionnaire's disease is. And we were at some point very close to the opening, wondering whether we would eradicate a whole, you know, generation of people in Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, we had to buy even more filters for the water, and then, um, and it was really, um, it was, it was kind of crazy. And then we had to figure out how to, how to. Um, at one point, we decided that we couldn't figure out how to filter the water, and it was too dangerous. So we we're going to take city water, but the problem is the amount of water we needed. You couldn't flush the toilet anywhere in the city, you know, without. Um, you know, when, when we used the, the city water. So anyway, we went into, we did the lake water. We did, ultimately, we got through the research and we got to this um, place where we felt very comfortable with it. But um, I think every project is like that. We, um, the project I didn't, you know, it was just too much to show today, but a uh, project we did for Lincoln Center, Alice Tully Hall's big uh, urban project, um, we did just scrappy research on new materials and new uh, kind of uh, effects that can happen with, with materials and lighting um, that produce kind of qualities of the human blush and things like that. Um, and we, we do this all the time. And I, I think it's, uh, it's just very characteristic of, of the studio to, uh, to not be afraid of things that we don't know um, and to believe somehow in our great naivete that we'll figure it out. And so far, we haven't been sued and we haven't killed anyone, so I guess we've been successful. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi, I have, uh, I have a question about sort of the public and private relationship between your work. It seems like a lot of the projects you talked about tonight were uh, for public consumption only. And, and that's the beauty of it, of course. I mean, there's a mechanism that works when there are, are many people interacting with one idea. And I'm just curious if it would work or if your firm has any interest in creating something that an individual could own, say, or would that change the rules? Would that change your motivation entirely if somebody wished to perhaps, say, purchase the fog building, say, or something like that? Uh, hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that we're that such purists that we would, um, you know, not take a commission to do uh, an experiment. And, and in the case of uh, the, the blur building, it was actually, there was, um, uh, you know, there was somebody in the Mideast that was actually interested in buying it. It never, never happened. It didn't really make sense for the Mideast. Um, but um, but I, I, th I think that, you know, we're very, 
I don't know, we're, we, we, we do have a, a democratic aspirations and we really think in public space and public, and public sites. Um, but we also do, occasionally we do a house where we do something uh, where there's an experiment involved that's on a very small scale, uh, where we have the funding and we have the ability to, um, you know, to, to do something for an individual that it will, um, it will expand our own research and, it, you know, it won't be seen by millions of people, but it will give us some satisfaction in terms of being able to bring our work forward. And the Slow House, one of our projects in the early 1990s was very much that. It was a uh, single family house. Um, and, and that project spawned a lot of ideas later about the relationship between um, architecture and technology, high and low technologies, um, and, um, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, uh, optics and, and views and so forth. Um, so, you know, I, I think that it's all interesting. We would stop short of doing a project for uh, a client that we didn't believe in, you know, or that we had, we were at political odds with. Um, so, so, you know, we're very ethical that way, but I don't think it's so much a public-private divide. Um, talking about ethics, um, one of the uh, um, one of the hypotheses in your project is, I think, that um, there must be some cost involved <laughs> in the way you are conceiving and executing your project. I mean, especially the 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 blur thing in Switzerland. I mean, it probably needs a combination of a New Yorker with a Swiss to make it uh, for the for different reasons. So the question is. Um, given the fact that the more and more we're operating in an environment that is particularly critical with uh, large-scale projects, unless they are, I would say, um, an, invest an investment for the future I as, an, as an experiment, say, mm -hmm. as a research. I wonder how would it would be with your work if you were uh, brought in, the s in a situation that would be working in a frugal way. Working from, in working from a frugal point of frugal, view. Frugal. Uh -huh. In a, a frugal, I mean, that it's how would be a project by Dylan and Scofidio if it was supposed to be cheap? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we do a lot of cheap projects, too. <laughs> um, you know, we, we live in a world where funding is very, very difficult to come by, and... Um, you know, I think that the the even to just to finish the High Line is really it's it's very very difficult to raise the money to do a, a civic project in New York. So um, you know, even New York has so much wealth. The city, the city itself has um, seemingly has wealth to put money into a public civic project as opposed to paying the police and the and the uh, fire department and so forth and the teachers. It's it's a conflict, and. Um, I have to say that, that New York, we have been the beneficiaries in the last uh, 12 years of, of the Bloomberg administration. Uh, and, and Bloomberg is a very, very unusual mayor uh, in that he's a, he's a billionaire. He has a foundation, and he also um, he, he earns a dollar a year, I think, in his job. So his decisions are motivated by profit. But um, there has been this great um, New York um, sustenance of the work that we've been doing. They've been very, very interested and, and helped us to raise money from uh, also private sources. And um, um, the, the question, I mean, yes, a lot of the work is, uh, is, is at a scale where, like the Lincoln Center uh, particularly, it was the most expensive project uh, that we did. I would say Highline is much less, you know, for the area that it is. It's, it's remediation mostly and pavers, and that's an example of frugality, I think, in the end. Um, but we're, we're, you know, we're very concentrated on that, on that problem, and right now we um, have proposed a project for New York, which is, um, and, and, and New York is very interested in doing this, it's a new cultural institution that is unbranded, and it's the, um, and it takes all sorts of things from visual to, um, to performing arts to creative industries, um, 
it, it kind, kind of a little bit uh, like a Kunsthall, but it, New York doesn't have a Kunsthall. Um, but it, so it can take many, many different things, but it has a um, unusual site of a public space where it can duplicate its footprint, it could expand its footprint. And by doing so, it could be nearly entirely self-sustaining. So we're able to bring culture um, to this, in an in this international uh, kind of framework, um, uh, you know, as architects, doing something that architects don't do. Architects typically spend money. Uh, we conceived of a project that actually could um, sustain uh, creative industry and, and culture in the city without having to resort to private philanthropy or government money. So, I mean, I think that the question you, you, you raise is kind of, you know, it's a, a rhetorical, I'm sure, it's not meant to be really um, responded to, but I could just say that, that uh, you know, when there's no money, we, we will continue to do, to do work because um, the work is self-motivated, you know, and, uh, you know, we do installations as well as architecture, and architecture is just a recent phenomenon for us, you know, we were... Um, laying uh, cones on Columbus Circle and, and, and doing things that were very, uh, very inexpensively and continue to do that and b do projects for print and uh, for the internet and so forth. I just want to say thank you for your, your presentation. It was great. Um, thank you. Uh, a few years ago also, we got to see James Corner do a lecture here as well, and it was also wonderful. And I was just wondering, um, is it okay? Yeah. yeah. I was just wondering if you could um, speak a little bit about your relationship. I, th the success of the High Line just goes to show what a close collaborative effort can produce, and and the importance of that. Can you touch a little bit on your your working relationship with them or other landscape architects um, from the competition phase through to implementation? Yeah, that that um, competition. Uh, we went into um, together collaboratively and uh, almost without um, disciplinary divisions. Um, we just put our heads together to try to figure out how to how to respond to this uh, to this infrastructure um, with the given problem that I that I, I specified that here's uh, it's so it's so narrow. How do you bring the public up without destroying this very fragile ecology that was already there? Um, anyway, we had to reproduce it. We couldn't really save it. It had to because it's toxic right now. Um, so, um, so we, uh, our studio and James's studio, um, put our heads together and we came up with a strategy. And um, the city just responded, and Friends of the High Line responded. So we were competing against four or five other firms, four other firms, um, and each of them fell into the trap of exactly the problem of. This, the thinness and, and, um, and having to make a space for feed and a space for plants. Um, so with, with James, we were, able, we were right on the same page, right at the beginning. Um, and then the question came, well, how do you now divide up the work? Because what's landscape, what's architecture? So the way we worked was we continued to um, work together on all the components, the paving system, the benches, the lighting, the... Uh, um, the Peter Udolf was brought in to do the the, um, uh, the horticulture, and um, and and we basically divided up ultimately the role of who draws up what and who's responsible for what legally, you know, and and that's kind of how it in the end it, it it came to that because it's it's essentially a park, so. So James did everything that had to do with the planting and the uh, the soil base and the irrigation and uh, just everything that had to do with with plants, and we did that. We drew up everything that had to do with the hard stuff and the access and the lighting and you know other pieces of infrastructure. And so you know, in the end, we you know we I saw him today. I mean, we just. Um, you know, like we somehow we made this magic together. It was not without a lot of tension, I have to say, between us, but uh, but we ultimately succeeded. Okay, one last one. Um, thank you, Bob, for your presentation. I j I, I, I'm just uh, curious to know if uh, the sonic dimension is a part of your preoccupations. Uh, do you think of sound, of the sound that will happen, or 
the sound ambiences uh, in your project. For example, um, uh, the high line was a very noisy line when, when the train was passing there. And now it's uh, uh, perhaps a, a very quiet uh, space in New York. How do, oh, so do you sorry, think of sound sometimes? Sound, sound, right? Yes, uh -huh. sound in sound ambiences in your project. Yeah. They happen upstream in the process of, uh, of design or during or just in the end. This is uh, the, the mm -hmm, question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a really interesting uh, question. I, we, we have. Um, We've not designed sound, you know, it's something that I interests. Uh, we, do, we do sound design for video and stuff like that, but we haven't designed sounds. And, um, and, uh, but, we, but we often think about sound in relationship to acoustics um, and very, very uh, uh, directly. Um, we we um, have done a couple of uh, spaces, you know, the, especially uh, Tully Hall, uh, Concert Hall, where um, the sound, um, just, uh, just the first time we ever really thought uh, about architecture and sound together. Um, it seems natural and obvious, but it wasn't so obvious to us how the shape of a space and how, um, um, you know, how the sound is transmitted just through space and through materials. Um, th that particular project uh, is, is built uh, on, a, on a subway on New York City subway, and every time an express tr uh, uh, train passes, there's a vibration of the building which transmits sound, and and um, and is almost inaudible, uh, pr precisely because the um, the the uh, uh, the HVAC equipment, the air conditioning, was so loud that it drowned out the noise of the the hum of the subway. Uh, but but in renovating, we had to deal with the absence of sound entirely because we isolated everything. The acoustic equipment was so um, uh, the 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 um, the the HVAC equi equipment was so quiet that it was too quiet, and so we had to figure out how to introduce sound back into it. You know, and so it's a, the the kind of river and and so not only sound. Uh, that is uh, that's airborne and transmitted through materials, but but um, the shape of sound itself and how uh, sound is produced on the stage and delivered um, in any kind of intimate way. So in that way, sound. But you know, I, I would say that in some of these projects, the um, the ambient sound, the existing sound that's already there, is is often kind of interpreted into the space. It's understood as part of the site specificity of a of a space. So in the case of the High Line, um, we did acknowledge the train, the the uh, the, the sound of traffic because you get the pulse of the traffic all the time, and it's 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 actually very beautiful because um, it's the one place in New York that you don't have to stop for lights across the street; you just keep going, but you experience the grid in this kind of on-off way. So sometimes you're mid-block, and then you come into an intersection. And you hear the ambient sound of the traffic, and then you go mid-block, and you don't hear it anymore. And so, that the the soundscape is really super interesting. Um, so, but it's nothing that we actually made or tried to do anything with. Um, the one uh, maybe example of of sound that is you know in the presentation that I could point to that that maybe a, again inadvertently the the blur building was a, a white noise. I mean, we were. You know the 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 white out and white noise was very much part of it. So to kind of create a kind of defamiliarized setting, acoustically and visually, and um, the uh, artist Christian Markley did a piece, a sound piece for the Blur Building, which was just amplified dr dr drop drip drops of water inside. So when you're inside. You hear the white noise, and then occasionally you hear wa water dropping, and <laughs> and you don't know whether the water is just dripping more in one area than another, and so it's almost, you know, like it's the equivalent of invisible, in uh, auditory way, like it's there, but you have to really pay attention and almost know it's there to to understand it and s and hear it. Okay. Well, I hear, uh, uh, but uh, but talking about sound, <laughs> the grumbling of stomachs. Okay.